This episode of Going In Raw is sponsored by Liquid IV. The heat is here and your favorite summertime treat could be giving you extraordinary hydration. With refreshing flavors like Popsicle Firecracker and Rainbow Sherbet, Liquid IV has the iconic flavors of summer when you need transformative, hydrating relief all season long. A single stick of Liquid IV delivers better hydration than water alone with three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink, plus eight vitamins and nutrients, making it the ideal companion for all your summertime activities. Whether you're going to summer festivals, enjoying the outdoors, or or if you're like Steve and I, playing basketball. So tear, pour, and live more with the number one powdered hydration brand in America and indulge in hydration this summer with Liquid IV. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use code RAW at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using promo code RAW at liquidiv.com. Hey, Brendo, Steve here. Hey, Larson. Welcome back to Going In Raw Count Out on today's episode, because last week, in honor of the Judgment Day breaking up in pretty dramatic fashion, we looked at the best faction splits in wrestling history. Today, we're going to the other end of that particular spectrum. We're going to go and take a look at the worst splits in faction history. Now, uh, a quick word of warning. A lot of these are just whimpers, and that's sort of the point. Yeah, that is sort of the point. You know, so many of... Uh, we're used to factions breaking up and having it be like a climactic thing, you know, which deal, leads yeah. to feud. So many of these are feuds that just kind of... Fizzle out. Fizzled out. Yeah. Just like the air being slowly let out of a balloon. I noticed some of them are like... It's it's like the feud almost seems like obligatory. It's like might as well just get these guys into a feud because the faction's breaking up. Yeah, yeah. But then, uh, you know, so, but, yeah. but so often, yeah, seemingly it's just we don't know what to do, so we'll just. Oh no, I started talking like Bruce Pritchard there. I don't know what we're gonna do, so let's just <laughs> split them up. He probably he probably has said that before. And that's the other thing also is that the well the other aspect of it is not just creative malaise. It's uh, just real life. Real life gets in the way yeah, of these Yeah, very factions. often li- real life gets in the way of, of maybe some some well-laid plans. We don't know. Which one of them is kind of bizarre, but we'll dive into it first up. Number 10. 10. The New Day. So this uh, goes back to the 2020 WWE Draft. I believe it was on October 9th of 2020. And the New Day, Kofi Kingston, Xavier Woods just won the tag titles. And then right after that match, it was announced where the New Day were getting drafted. Mm-hmm. They're all in the ring. Kofi, yeah. Xavier Woods, Big E. And they find out that Woods, Kingston, they're going to Raw. Yeah. Big E is staying on SmackDown. And it was plainly obvious they were not told in advance where they were going because you could see the heartbreak written all over their faces that they were being split up. Now, they didn't break up in the sense that they were no longer a faction. It was just they were split up and that Big E would be representing New Day on SmackDown, Woods, and Kingston over on Raw. And, you know, it seemed like it was the, the, the split was to precede what was going to be a Big E singles push, mm-hmm. which did, in fact, follow. He won money at the bank. Um, and uh, eventually cashed in on Bobby Lashley and before dropping the title at uh, day one. Mm-hmm. But especially given what happened the year prior with Kofi winning the title at WrestleMania and him becoming world champion while the New Day were a unit. Mm-hmm. And their friendship playing such a strong role in that story. Yeah. It seems strange to say, all right, we're going to split them now for Big E to go on his push. And then it was then when uh, Big E finally cashed in, it wasn't on Roman Reigns on SmackDown. It was on Lashley on Raw. So they were kind of reunited towards the end of 2021, I believe. In mm-hmm. September, I think, of 2021. Only for the following month for Kofi and Xavier to get drafted to SmackDown. Well, Big E stayed on Raw. This is one of those situations where, number one, did they ever confirm that they found out in the ring? 
I think so, but it was, I mean, it seemed pretty obvious that. It seemed pretty obvious, and and I, I just didn't know if they had ever confirmed that, but I think, I want to say they did. Um, yeah, it was, it, that's horrible. Like, they, they, they became, at that point, I think they were still the longest uh, uh, yeah, yeah, tag was, team champions the, in uh, history. Yeah, the, the, the Uso set the new record for the longest title reign, yeah. Right, and... They had meant so much to the WWE. They'd brought in probably tons of revenue because their merchandise is always on point. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had been around for such a long time. And to see them split up, you know, it, the thing is, it's it's pro wrestling. And I understand when people say, oh, you should never split the New Day. You know, nobody should ever turn on anybody. I get that to a degree, but it's also pro wrestling. If there's a story to tell about a family breaking up, then you tell it. Um, the one thing you don't do, or you don't tell it, the one thing you don't do is split them up via draft and then you just don't even tell them until they're in the ring because you want their genuine reaction, I guess. But when the genuine reaction is sort of at the cost at what could be a really fun, dramatic moment where everybody's collaborating and they have the opportunity to perform, you know, a, a story like, I don't know why that would ever be what what weird, you know, perverse thrill is there out of, oh, hey, I'm going to. You know, now these guys aren't going to be able to travel together, and these guys because there's real life circumstances there are, there on the are, outside. Absolutely, of this. absolutely. I mean, that, that's the case with the, when anybody gets drafted to a different brand. Mm -hmm. Is you know, people travel with certain people. They have probably flights and hotel reservations and rental cars booked for for the yeah. upcoming weeks. So they have to change all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it was just it's like, man, really, that's how you do it. And then and then like when you start, sorry, when you start like. I guess fantasy booking as fans, what we do, yeah, different ways that, and it's funny because under Vince, you always knew that 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 you know, oh wow, this could be a way to X, Y, and Z. This could be a way. What if Big E starts his own version of the New Day on SmackDown, and they get together for big pay per views or whatever? And or what if this is part of a larger story? And it never was. No, it was it wasn't. never a part. Like you said, they got back together and then they split up again. Like. Why? Like under what circumstances? And then on top of that, the lack of consistency because other factions with three or more people would get drafted wholesale to brands. So it didn't even make sense in that regards. It was just breaking every possible rule of their own um, just for, I, I don't know what, you know, because, okay, you have your moment where they broken up. And then you have, I guess, kind of a celebratory moment where they're back together, but I don't even know if they really explored that all that much. And then they got drafted back away, so it's like, no, we want to keep them apart. Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. There's no no good reason no, for that. No, there's not. I mean, the only reason and I could think of is to try to establish Big E as a single star. But they you never could, put any other effort into they that. They didn't. They didn't. I know. And, and you could do that while he's still an active member of the new day. They On did the it with brand. Kofi yeah. Kingston. Yeah. And that yeah. story was tremendous be for a lot of reasons. One of which was his relationship with Big E and Xavier Woods and yeah. how that led to him getting that title match. You think yeah. back to that moment where they were, uh, uh, Kofi and Xavier had to go through the tag gauntlet mm -hmm. and the Uso stepped aside said out of respect we're we're going to we're going to forfeit this match. Yeah. How powerful that was. How amazing yeah, that great. was. What great television that that was. Yeah. And to to bypass an opportunity to get that kind of emotional resonance while Big E is uh, 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 you know uh, trying to become world champion was a massive missed opportunity. And if you're going to have the guy go solo, do the whole Triple H game rebrand. Like, have the guy go solo. Say, the new day's in the past. This is a split. That's the only way I still maintain. That's the only way people would have really gotten on board with it is if he had an actual split. And he and I understand they gave him his own theme song, but he was still, like, New Day branded, basically, with the exception of a few times he would Seinfeld brand himself. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, it's just, it's like, man, you can't have it both ways. I don't know why you're half in, half out with this stuff. Either you go all in on the guy or you allow him to remain with the New Day and they do, like you said, the Kofi thing. But uh, it was all so half-assed. Yeah. And it was just another example of Vince's, you know, decline uh, with his uh, booking prowess. Anyways, moving on now to number nine. Nine. The Straight Edge Society. You know, looking back on, on how they broke up, it's like the breakup itself. It was. It wasn't terrible. 
Mm -hmm. It's just that the breakup led to two people losing their jobs. Well, yeah, apparently, and this is the one of the ones I was talking about that was like really weird was I, I and I didn't do any d uh, deeper digging into this. Maybe you did, but the idea that Serena Deeb lost her job because she wasn't being straight edge in her real life. That's what I said in that one video. Yeah, I know. No, I didn't really I look any more into it, but uh, that, but it's just strange that it wouldn't shock me. It's one of those things where I'm like, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, it's Vince. Yeah. You know, where it, so you know, straight edge society was CM Punk, Serena Deeb, Luke Gallows, and Joey Mercury. Mm, yeah, and uh, I believe Punk was in the midst of a feud with Kane and Undertaker, or at least Undertaker for sure. And uh, there was security uh, footage of Serena Deeb at a bar drinking, which if you're straight mm -hmm. edge, you can't drink alcohol. You know, I do that. So Punk goes and confronts her in the bar. Eventually, they kind of patch things up. They move into a feud against Big Show. Mm -hmm. They lose a handicap match, three-on-one handicap match to him. Punk walks out, and that effectively ends straight edge society. Deeb gets released. Um, Joey Mercury is injured and it was a thing where, where Punk and Gallows had a bit backstage where Punk's like I don't want to see you faction's done and then Gallows said I didn't come to confront you about this I want to let you know after I win tonight I'm going to celebrate with a beer mm. they have match Punk wins that Gallows is released yeah you know it's funny because when you look at the story of um, uh, basically a cult leader. Uh, you can call it, uh, I don't know, you can call it whatever you want, but it's basically a cult leader. Mm -hmm. And, and he's a bad guy, and you've got these characters under, under thumb. There is such a great opportunity there. I mean, to a degree, uh, at the most, at the, at the, the best example of something similar to this, of course, is Roman Reigns and the Bloodline. Mm -hmm. You've got a head character, a lead character, who has everybody under thumb, everybody walks on eggshells around him. And as we've seen with the bloodline, you have an opportunity to tell a lot of great stories yeah. with all those characters. And for this basically to be big show beats a lot of people. Ray Mysterio beats punk loses his hair, but then it's kind of a, a, a gag because he's got the mask on. So, it, you know, group still intact. He's able to manipulate them further. And then just like big show beats them and they're done. Like yeah. that is just, it's just whack. It's like, man, you've got people like gallows is a hell of a personality. And Serena Deeb, as we've seen in AEW, I mean, terrific wrestler. Yeah. Um, and uh, and you got Mercury there. You have the opportunity for some interesting stories about the breakup. It seemed like just the kind of thing, and I don't know, it pro Punk probably talked about this, but it seemed like the kind of thing where Vince was like, yeah, I'm done with this. Let's move on with something else. Um, and, I mean, something else ended up being much bigger plans for CM Punk. He took over the new Nexus, but right after that was the yeah, – months know, after that, yeah. The pipe yeah. bomb, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it was just it was just a really lame, you know, it was, it was the big show. Big show beat them and then they broke up. And that's mm -hmm. kind of it. And mm -hmm. it was super lame. But the idea, the branding, you know, whenever CM Punk is, is able to sort of brand something with his style, mm -hmm. it, it looks cool as hell. Isn't is it straight uh, edge society when he wasn't doing anything? And so he went and wrote 14 weeks of television and took it to this. Yeah, that was the same time. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was straight edge society stuff, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, you know, it's just a big, big whimper of a finish to the yeah. straight edge society, which is a really cool, I a yeah. really cool idea. And you look at what they did along the way, like when he was in the Royal rumble and, you know, he would eliminate somebody and he'd start preaching to the people. Basically. Yeah. He was dropping promos in between them eliminations. That's clever stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it is an underwhelming end to a faction that had a lot of promise. Yeah, absolutely. and you know whatever the backstage happenings going on that led to Gallows and and D being released, don't know for sure. Maybe that information is out there, um, but you know if if the decision was made to let them go and that's what led to the faction's demise, it's mm -hmm. a bummer. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah, if if the idea was we are going to let go of these people and the faction is just going to you know go with it, then then that absolutely was a bummer and. You know, if, if it's true or not, I don't know what the, sh what the you know, mechanisms there are. But uh, regardless, on camera, it, it just didn't, didn't It didn't really resonate, work. yeah. 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 Let's move on to number eight. Eight. The pinnacle. So, you know, if, if, if the crescendo of their breakup was 
a well executed, well delivered Wardlow versus MJF match. Mm -hmm, yeah, it caught, it probably went pretty good. Yeah, right. But that match, you know, the the story is well known about MJF kind of holding out uh, in advance of this contest. There was some uncertainty whether he's going to show up at all. Did kind of phoned it in. This match was very formulaic, and then he was gone for a while. Yeah, and because of the lack of kind of crescendo with this match, Pinnacle never really had a situation where they imploded. Again, it was a situation where it kind of underwhelmingly just kind of fizzled out after that match. I think FTR and Wardlow had a brief reunion using the Pinnacle name. Yeah. Um, Sean Spears yeah. came back. And this was months after Double or Nothing when the MJF Wardlow match happened. And then it was just kind of dropped. Yeah, Wardlow versus MJF. That happened at uh, Double or Nothing. All Out. In 2022. Two. Two, yeah. 2022. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would have been 2022. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Because then, like, in September of that year, Sean Spears came back from injury, I think. October, sorry. And, uh, and they kind of reformed, but then it just, <laughs> just dropped it. Yeah. So, I mean, th that's, yeah, there, there's a, there's a lot going on here, including like FTR just sort of firing Tully Blanchard out of nowhere. Like that just sort of happened. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember all these pieces. So yeah, it's funny because like the pinnacle started off great because it yeah. was the Jericho stuff. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I really liked the MJF infiltrate MJF and Wardlow infiltrates the inner circle and you wonder how this is all going to play out. And it turns out that MJF ends up uh, forming his own faction while he's infiltrated the inner circle. And of course, you know, it, it, it's uh, FTR and Telly Blanchard, Wardlow, Sean Spears. And and so it's like, oh, wow, that's really cool. But it only really lasted the one feud because it ended up doing a stadium stampede match where inner circle finally gets their own, which makes sense. You know, Pinnacle's a bad guy. And I think Pinnacle. Uh, oops. I think Pinnacle won. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Pinnacle won at Blood and Guts. And then they lost at Stadium Stampede. Okay, cool. But then they go straight into, I think, Wardlow and MJF. Because there's always been little signs of yeah, Wardlow yeah, yeah. MJF. And and then, you know, like, uh, then FTR ends up doing their thing. Uh, Wardlow turns on MJF to a degree uh, when he won't give C, uh, the, the Dynamite Diamond Ring to him during the CM Punk match. Um, and then I guess we'll see here. Uh, so he left on the March 9th episode of Dynamite. And on that same episode, FTR kicked out Tully Blanchard. And then they just didn't really do. Well, then FTR left at the end of March. But I think it was, wasn't it like, it was it like a solid like oh we're leaving you it just i think like a fizzled out deal they fizzled out yeah, yeah it just fizzled out and so it, yeah the, that's what i remember about the pinnacle is that it just just kind of fizzled out and like if yeah. they had, if they had built up to the mjf warlow match a double or nothing everybody was like all right i, I got warlow's back no i got mjf's back yeah like and a have kind of like the yeah. secondary story of that match you know like battle lines are drawn within pinnacle mm -hmm. all comes to a head Warlow comes out the wind side of it. Yeah. Faction done. Right. Yeah. You know, that 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 would be like, all right, that makes sense. It all built mm -hmm. built up to a, a, a climax. And then, you know, after that, everybody goes their separate ways. But it just kind of, I don't know. I mean, you could have done a thing where, you know, you kept it going to until that match. And MJF is telling his guys to help him against Wardlow. And they all turn his back on him. Boom. Dramatic moment. So, Faction's done. Sort of like you know Wardlow did with MJF and the, uh, the dog collar match against Punk. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can tell some, you know, mirror some storylines there. But, you know, as with a lot of stuff, as with a lot of AEW factions, they just sort of like fizzle away and then you don't hear from them again. Yeah. Um, that happens here and there. So, anyways, before we get on to the next one, Larson, would you like to pay some bills? Let's do it. Let's take a quick break here. Good work from our sponsor, Liquid IV, Steve. Temperatures mm. are rising. The summer heat is here. And with it comes some beloved summer treats. I'm talking about snow cones. Delicious. Popsicles. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Marble cake with frozen whip topping. Oh. Is that like a standard summertime treat in the larson household it definitely was 
But what if your favorite summer treat could also turn your ordinary water into extraordinary hydration? Mm, good point. Well, Larson, Liquid IV has refreshing flavors like rainbow sherbet and popsicle firecracker that bring the taste of summer as well as transformative hydration to help you beat the heat. Listen, a huge, massive slab. I'm talking like three inches by three inch square, all right? Of wow. marble cake with a thick layer of frozen whip topping. It's delicious, but it's mm. not going to keep you and me, Steve, from getting dehydrated during our weekly basketball games. You know what's going to keep That's us right. hydrated? Mm. Liquid IV. That's right, Liquid IV. Yeah, Liquid IV, it's essential. It powers us through our two-hour one-on-one sessions in this Northern California heat. And it's also the ideal companion for all your summertime activities, whether you're traveling, uh, enjoying the outdoors, going to some summer festivals, or just looking to recover from a night out. That's right. Powered by Live Hydra Science, which is an optimized ratio of electrolytes, essential vitamins, and clinically tested nutrients. One stick of Liquid IV hydrates better than water alone and offers three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink. Liquid IV is also vegan, gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, and always non-GMO. So tear, pour, and live more with the number one powdered hydration brand in America. Indulge in hydration this summer with Liquid IV. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use code RAW at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code RAW at liquidiv.com. Let's move on now to number seven. Seven. Too cool. Of course, the the, uh, the trios of Rikishi. Yeah. Grandmaster Sexay. Brian Christopher, yeah. Scotty Too Hotty. Correct. Yeah. They kind of reached their peak, like leaning up to King of the Ring 2000, I believe. They were tag champs. Yeah. They, they were, were super over. Super Rikishi popular. Rikishi was Intercontinental Champion. Yeah, they were all super mm-hmm. over. There yeah. was like a fatal four-way match there for the tag titles. Edge and Christian won. And mm-hmm. after that, it was kind of all downhill for Brian Christopher, Scotty Too Hotty. Uh, you had the Rikishi heel turned in there as well. Yeah, that kind of thing did the did it because they were they were like you know you can't be a heel and then doing cool dance moves in the middle of the ring, some Ray Gun esque break dancing in the middle of the ring. That ain't gonna work, Larson. If Although you're a you know, bad I will guy. counter with this: you could be a heel. You say Ray Gun's a heel? <laughs> well, that's I think that's open to interpretation. I was gonna say something along the lines. Remember that scene of American Psycho where Christian Bale. Going after Paul Allen with the axe, listen to mm-hmm. Huey Lewis. Huey Lewis dancing. Yeah. yeah. There was some cool dance moves, but it was sinister because he was also murdering at the time. So I think there is a way you could yeah. be a heel and still bust out cool dance moves. That's a good point. Uh in this case they opted not to go. It didn't work with in this that. case, no. No. Uh instead, Rikishi, conspiracy guy, did it for the rock. Uh and uh and then and the other guys. Ended up, I mean, kind of the real life thing came into play because uh, Brian Christopher, I think, or uh, Scotty Too Hotty, yeah, was an injury, injury or a yeah, ball thing. Injury, yeah, neck injury. Take some time off, like a lot of time off for a neck yeah. injury, and then Brian Christopher got released. Yeah, he had some issues. Yeah, and uh, and then like they, you know, they, I think they came back at some point, but you know, without Rikishi, it it really was like one of those things where I don't even know how long it was, but I don't think they were. A big deal. They were a big deal, but for a very short period of time. Yeah, they were. They were. I remember them being super over, though. Super over. Oh, they were super over. Super over. Yeah. Um, I think it was Rikishi and Scotty Tuhati that reformed. I want to say in 2003. Um, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there are several reunions, but that's one that kind of sticks out in my mind. Um, But by then, you know, the magic had, had been lost. It wasn't quite the same thing. Um, you know, but yeah. Rikishi was in that one hell in the cell. He had that huge spot off the top of the cell. Like Rikishi was getting the singles push, you know, mm-hmm. and then for whatever reason, Vince decided, well, if we're going to give him a singles push, he's got to be a heel. And that kind of took the air out of everything. So just for some context here, they had their first mess. So they had actually branded themselves too cool in June of 99, but because of a knee injury to Grandmaster Sexy, Brian Christopher, they didn't actually have a match until October 99. Um, they were bad guys. Mm-hmm. And, uh, later on that year, Rikishi joined the team, and they became good guys. So we're talking like November, December 99. And then by the time 
what is this? Uh, so King of the Ring yeah. 2000 probably so been May a, or June. So by that point, a, a year later, a year later, Rikishi left the group to be a bad guy. So they, 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 they yeah, it was they peaked. They peaked six months after their debut, and then six months later, they were done. Mm-hmm. Essentially, yeah, um, very short period of time. But uh, I kind of expect that from a gimmick that was pretty limited. I don't remember a single. Well, okay, that's not true. I remember. I definitely remember Brian Christopher dropping some Grandmaster Sex A promos, or at least talking a bit. I don't remember Sky too much. He didn't talk very much, no. I don't think he talked at all, or much at all. Um, But they did a lot of cool dancing. They had that cool moment in the Royal Rumble where they stopped everything and just had like a dance. And then Rikishi eliminated them both, but they're all cool with it. Um, But yeah, they, you know, they, uh, they flew pretty high, but for a pretty short period of time. Yep. Yep. The Icarus of factions, you're saying, yes? <laughs> I didn't want to go there, but they went too close to the sun, and I guess the sun in this case would be Rikishi's giant ass. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Let's move on to number six. Six. SoCal Uncensored. SCU. So, to be fair, the actual story of how they ended up breaking up was pretty decent. I think what we're talking about here is the literal execution of well, them, the moment of their breakup. That's part of it, yes. So, even at that moment, like in theory, SCU was still Christopher Daniels, Frankie Kazarian, and Scorpio Sky, but around that time, it was like Scorpio was already off doing his own thing. I think it was around that time that him and Ethan Page were already kind of doing their, or at least on the precipice of doing the men of the year thing. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah, but specifically, it's it's the match that Kazarian and Daniels had against the Young Bucks, where if they lost, they'd have to break up as a tag team. They lost. Tony Khan cannot cut away fast enough from the end of that match. Mm-hmm. SCU was the first AEW, were the first AEW tag team champs. When AEW, I think people forget this, when AEW started, SCU was super over. They were hugely the yeah. whole. This is the worst town I've ever been to. I remember going to the very first All In. There were so many people with SCU shirts. Oh yeah, they yeah, were they incredibly were popular in being yeah. the elite Ring of Honor and coming over to AEW, the first tag champs. And for them not to get any sort of send off with the team breaking up with Daniels Kazarian, who have been tag partners forever. To not get a decent send off, any sort of send off, when they're forced to break up on TV. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! What they kind of did. This is hilarious because I went back and watched it again. Yeah, and it's you know you can, there's no streaming service right now. Can we get a move on on that, please, yeah, Tony? Please, I know come he said on. there's some. Come on, there's some Warner big Brothers, news make coming that up part here, of the deal. Let's back get catalog. the goddamn library up. The back catalog would be nice. So if you recall, obviously, like you said. Young Bucks win, they immediately cut to yeah. what's going on backstage. But they do come back, and it says, moments ago. Oh, that's and it, right. And they, they show the embrace. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they that's all they got. They got moments ago, they show the hug, and we're done. It's like, oh, we got we to cut the next segment. Oh, shoot, we missed the moment. Yeah. We'll do a yeah, replay. There were so many television issues back then. There but were. that's like a really egregious one. I know. Like, how do you not have the foresight to be like, okay, this group, which helped put us on the map, they're going to break up in a phenomenal match. It was a great match. It was a really good match. And this is going to be a big moment. We got to milk this moment as much as we can. Crowd's going to be chanting, you know, uh, you know, whatever. Thank you, SCU or whatever. Yes. Yeah. There's going to be chanting SCU. SCU. Maybe, Sky was a bad guy at that point. He'd already turned heel at that point. Uh, so maybe him. But hell, I don't know. Fuck it. It's AEW. They break kayfabe all the time. Just break kayfabe, have Sky come out, and be cool with them. I mean, he wasn't beefing with them. He was beefing with other people. Mm-hmm. So have them come out there, and they all hug, and they have their little uh, curtain call moment. No. As soon like it, it's like Kazarian's face. He's like, and then, oh, my God, what's happening backstage? Yeah. And then they get a moment to go replay. So, and then that, and that was it. That was it. Yeah. Yeah, that was awful. That so was they awful. showed the hug, which probably lasted all of 30 seconds, rather than giving them a couple minutes to – to get their moment on on live television. Yeah, that was horrible. Later on, by the way, uh, Frankie Gazarian responded to like a tweet or an Instagram post saying that their breakup was a stupid creative decision. It wasn't there. It wasn't up to them. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyways, 
Let's move yeah, on. Yeah, then Frankie Kazarian ended up being the elite hunter. How'd that work out uh, for you? It, yeah, well, yeah, he's the elite hunter. But look at look at Christopher Daniels now. He's yeah, well, he's like anti. He's like anti elite authority figure. Though. He's interim executive vice president. Right. Waiting around for who to be the actual executive vice president. Is it Kenny? Kenny, is yeah, he he's, Kenny's? he's filling in for he's Kenny in Kenny's, Kenny's out. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Anyways, let's move on now to number five. Five. The Nexus, or more importantly, the core. It's all kind of one thing, man, and it's all a mess. It's a it's it's a big mess. It's a, if you'd been watching uh, the Nexus's debut mm. when they came out and annihilated John Cena, destroyed the entire ringside area. And, and Daniel Bryan's choking out Justin Roberts. A lot of people got... I wasn't watching wrestling then, but a lot of people got really excited about it. So I hear it anecdotally. I, like, wow. I got excited about it. Yeah, I because it. It's, it's not very often that someone, a group, comes in and makes that immediate of a massive and destructive impact. Brian Daniel, Danielson almost killed the guy. Yeah. He got fired because of it for a little bit. Mm-hmm. So the buzz was high for the Nexus heading into SummerSlam 2010. We all know the story. John Cena ended up wiping the floor at the entire Nexus. Um, and him and Wade Barrett feuded through the second half of 2010, culminating, I think, at a TLC pay-per-view where Wade Barrett was literally buried under a pile of chairs by John Cena. He mm-hmm, was literally yeah. buried by John Cena. That Well, that's what it would take to beat Wade Barrett. That's why people don't understand. He was so The idea was he's so strong and scary, bury him in a bunch of chairs. So the metaphor is lost on you, huh? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> so uh, Wade Barrett <laughs> kicked out of the Nexus. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, so he gets drafted to SmackDown along with right. Justin Gabriel, Heath Slater, because they want nothing to do with the new leader of the new Nexus, which is Phil Brooks, CM Punk. Right. Yeah. So you have Wade Barrett, you have Heath Slater, you have Justin Gabriel and Ezekiel uh, Jackson mm-hmm. over on SmackDown as the core. It's one of the worst shirts in wrestling history. Yeah, it's so awful. apparently, like the name "The Core" was already used. I don't know if the the copyright conflict was the movie or if there was another group in wrestling "The Core." I don't know. But they stuck but, an extra R in there, thinking it would uh, alleviate any copyright issues, huh? Yeah, Vince was like, "Well," and it's like, "No, your creative will alleviate any issues with this." Yeah, no one's going to be that awful shirt, the thing. diagonal logo. And so you got Phil over there on Raw with the Nexus, new Nexus, sorry, new Nexus, and they kind of not and you. It's just new, new. N-E-W. And they kind of rebranded around CM Punk, his logo. That, that was the main shirt, the main logo on the shirt with the, the old Nexus logo on the sleeve. Which is pretty cool, to be honest. I mean, because Phil's logo back then was cool. His shit is always cool. Core shirt, awful. And both of these factions just fizzled out. Yeah. So uh, CM Punk was involved in uh, Randy Orton losing the title to The Miz mm-hmm. um, when The Miz cashed in. He started feuding with Orton. That went to WrestleMania 27. Probably the best match of that show. Mm-hmm. Um, and once he started getting into the, the, the build-up to Money in the Bank 2011, after the pipe bomb especially, just any association with the new Nexus was just kind of dropped. Well, the pipe bomb, it, during the pipe bomb, he was wearing the Nexus armband. With a Stone Cold shirt on, yeah. With a Stone Cold Steve Austin shirt on, yeah. Um yeah, you know, in that new ne- Nexus, you had Husky Harris, Bray Wyatt. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had, I think, Mason Ryan was in yeah, that Yeah, Mason group. Ryan, uh, David Otunga. Otunga and, was in that uh, group too. And McGillicuddy. Yeah. And McG- yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, perfect skin. And so, yeah, and I do remember, like, you know, he would, there was there were shades of, like, the straight edge society that he would be doing, stuff like that. But um, just randomly out of nowhere, he dropped that pipe bomb. It's so funny because, like, a week before, he was just, he was like leading the new Nexus and he was trying to manipulate them. And then he just decides, or they have him, you know, oh, you're just going to go out there and drop this pipe bomb because you're going to get into a thing with Cena. And I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, there were some backstage segments where he was just like, yeah, whatever. You're, we're not the thing anymore. You know, I'm setting you free. I don't even know if it was that dramatic. But, uh, but yeah, just nothing happened with those guys. They didn't touch CM, like nothing happened no with feud, it. No, no. And then over there on the SmackDown brand, uh, if I remember correctly, they 
had a six man tag match that Wade Barrett eventually just walked out on. Yeah, because he was uh, kind of feuding with Ezekiel Jackson at that point. Mm-hmm. And so he walked well, out. Yeah, on. and they used that core stuff to generate a feud with Ezekiel so Jackson. So yeah. Slater and Gabriel were out there for the match by themselves. They confront They Wade were Barrett. tag champions, though. Yeah. You know, they confront Wade Barrett backstage and they are all just like, yeah, we don't be a faction anymore and just ended. No feud. Yeah. It's like we're going to yeah. end now. That's it. Just a limp, limp way to end a faction. For both of them. There's such promise with the Nexus when they debuted, you know? You know, I still maintain, this is my hot take, one cool, you know, it's funny, because like one cool story, one good match, one awesome promo can make a thing. Yeah. A person, an act, a tag team, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. One great moment, however cannot hide the inherent weakness of said act and the nexus coming in and wrecking everybody and almost killing a guy could not hide the fact that ryback was on that squad <laughs> <laughs> the entire blame at the feet of skip well, sheffield no, steve you know dude i think there's there there was some talent there i mean oh, obviously yeah. brian danielson yeah. like clearly but he got fired after trying to kill a guy and he was brought back I don't think he was Wade trying Barrett. to kill a guy. It just it's got it kind of got to oh, oh, take. Uh, Bro, you oh, got to oh, watch oh. that shit again. That dude was putting everything. No, <laughs> I know. Killing I Justin know. Ga- Justin Roberts. Uh, I Justin Gabriel was a, a phenomenal in ring talent guy. Don't remember a single word he ever said in a promo. We've seen Heath Slater's ceiling. Yeah, and it's comedy guy, and he's great well, at that. Only entertaining as comedy guy. Yeah, that's the ceiling. Um, Ryback is Ryback. Otunga was was Otunga in the oh no uh uh was uh, Fred Rosser. Mm-hmm. I like Fred Rosser. Yeah. I don't know what his ceiling was in the WWE because he was just sort of a blank slate guy. You know, he's been doing great work in uh, New Japan. He has, but it's been like ten years. You know, I think it just took him a lot of time to get to that point. Yeah. You know, no days off. I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the time, like he wasn't going to be a needle mover. And then uh, I don't know who else was in that group, but it was just sort of a lot of nothing pieces. You know, honestly, the new Nexus, if you think about it, had more like McGillicuddy was bad. I like that guy. Yeah. Bray Wyatt, obviously Bray Wyatt. Yeah. Mason Ryan. I don't know if the dude just couldn't hack it or didn't have the good attitude or couldn't wrestle. I don't know what his deal was. Great looking guy. Yeah. (laughs) Real great looking guy. Um, And then Otunga. I kind of feel like we saw his ceiling, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm as commentator mm-hmm. i don't know i don't know what um so yeah i just it was not the best crop it's not like you had you know grayson waller uh uh braun breaker Ilya dragon it's not like that dude. yeah yeah yeah. no i understand but, i understand i understand know, but you know it, you never know what could have happened had things turned out differently for them at SummerSlam 2010 because after that it was kind of a moot point after that, yeah, match, I don't disagree. It wasn't going to go anywhere. Yeah, and if they yeah. had come out the winning end of that match, like Wade Barrett is great. He had tons of upside. Mm-hmm. Could he be a potential world champion down the line? Don't know. But after SummerSlam, and definitely after he got buried under that mountain of chairs, again, kind of a moot point because it was never going to happen. It just wasn't yeah. going to happen. So if things had turned out differently, if there was some, if there was better creative, which is asking a lot. Um, who knows? I understand what you, you're, you're mentioned about the limitations of some of the members. I get it, but you know what I just remembered hmm. that's not on this list. Hmm. The ah, what were they called? What were they called? Not United Nations. Uh... Oh, League of Nations. Yeah, <laughs> they were just more of a bad faction. The breakup was whatever. I looked into. They were actually on the short list to be on here. It was a bad beginning, a bad middle, and a bad end. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe one day we'll just do bad faction. Yeah, that's if we haven't done that before, we definitely should. <laughs> we should. Anyways, let's go ahead and move on now to number four. Four. Yeah, Bullet, Bullet Club. Club. Kind of so, broke up. We're talking about when, like, the AEW basically came in and swooped the elite, Well, that was right? right yeah, right before. So there was the, the Cody-Kenny Omega feud. And there was like battle lines drawn where some people were back in Cody, some were back in Kenny. But while that was all going on, you had Tama Tonga, Tonga Loa, uh, Bad Luck Fale, 
There was that the the show, one of the G one specials. It was the one at the Cal Palace, I think. So after Cody and Kenny had their main event match for the title, uh, Tonga Loa, Tama Tonga and Haku came to the ring, and they laid out everybody. That was bad. And that's when they had the firing squad shirts. That's right, the firing squad. And yeah. so it seemed like whatever beef was going on between Kenny's side of the Bullet Club and Cody's side of the Bullet Club, that was all patched up because they were, they had the firing squad to deal with now. Mm-hmm, yeah. And that was all in the buildup to the elite leaving uh, uh, New Japan Ring of Honor. And it was a situation where you had this interesting possible split – but there was never the match, you know? Like, I think there was a, a never, yeah, there was a never open weight six man tag match, and that was the blow off where Tama Tonga, Tonga Loa, and Ishimori uh, beat uh, Young Bucks and another member of the elite um, for the never six man titles. Oh, was it Marty? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, that was the blow off to this. <laughs> well, you feud. mean it was former Ring of Honor six man <laughs> champion? Yes, yes. <laughs> that was the blow off. Like no, nothing with Kenny and Tama Tonga. Nothing, with, nothing. And the elite was like took to Twitter. We're not Bullet Club anymore. And on yeah, the eve of Wrestle Kingdom, they say that. we're starting their, our own promotion. Didn't Cody like tweet out uh, Jay White's now the leader of Bullet Club or something like that? I remember there being like. Yeah, no, I'm not doing this anymore, or something like that. I forget what it was, and Tom Tonga was like trying to figure out how to work t- uh, Twitter. So I guess Cody um, Cody did tweet out that he was no longer a member of Bullet Club, and I guess it was on talk as Jericho that Matt Jackson said Cody, yes, Cody, yes. Kenny, Marty, Nick, and Hangman had were not Bullet Club; they were just the elite. Yeah, that's right. That's what, you know what's so funny though is that I can go back all the way to the, our first experience watching that stuff. And always keeping one eye on Kenny and the Bucks, and they always had the Elite logo on. And sometimes it was more prominent than Bullet Club. It's like, oh, these guys are future-proofing themselves. Oh, yeah. That's not a terrible idea. No. Um, yeah, dude, this should have been a big, big deal. And I don't know if maybe New Japan felt burnt because they knew what was going on, and they couldn't get a deal done with them. And they just didn't want to even have them go out on their backs. Or if the Elite didn't want to participate in that. From what I remember, I thought the Young Bucks had said something like, or there was a report that they were upset that they weren't booked for more stuff to finish out their run um, because that could have been amazing. That, like, the Bullet Club Civil War could have been absolutely amazing. It could have been really good, yeah. Mm-hmm. And but, seeing uh, how that could yeah. have played in potentially to Kenny eventually losing to Tanahashi mm-hmm. at the Wrestle Kingdom in 2019 could have been interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it just it was an interesting setup that all just kind of fizzled out and didn't really go anywhere. And it's a bummer. It did a real disservice, I remember, to Tama Tonga, Tonga Loa, and the members of the Fiery Squad, because that could have been a feud that, you know, assuming they had gone over, really could have put them on, a ma- on the map as a force in, in New Japan. And they just, for whatever reason, we don't know, um, they never got that moment. And it was a bummer. It was a bummer. It was. Yeah, absolutely. Another bum- uh, bummer. Paul Roma, number three, three, the four horsemen. So obviously they were a force to be reckoned with going back all the way to, I guess, the 1960s with the uh, uh, wrecking crew (laughs) and cousins, brothers, uncle uncle and nephew and nephew. Yeah. uh, The Andersons. Yeah. uh, All the way up through the 70s and 80s, of course, when they were jet setting, high flying, blah, 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 blah. Uh, of course, in 91 is when Flair, what, 91 or 92? 91. When 91, it, 91 is when we went to WWF, yeah. Flair went to WWF, so Horseman done. Yeah. Uh, everybody sort of did their own things in, in Crockett's promotion there. And then he came back in 93. And uh, in the meantime, Tully Blanchard had been uh, let go from WCW. Apparently, I think, was it he felt like a del- drug test or something like that? He went to WWF and then he came back and they wouldn't take him because he felt drug test. According to this wrestling bios thing that we watched. Uh, and so when Flair came back, they uh, booked this segment on Flair for the gold. Because he couldn't wrestle. He had non-compete. So he had to have a talk show segment for a number of weeks or months because he couldn't actually contractually wrestle yet for WC. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So they were like, hey, let's put on Flair for the gold, which is the most 1980s talk show segment you could possibly get in 1993 yeah. <laughs> it's it's i swear dude i look at this thing i'm like 
this is not how I remember 93. This is how I remember 86. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, packaged like an episode of Donahue from 1985. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly yeah. correct. That is so frighteningly yeah. correct. So uh, you get this thing, and it's, and it's touted, it's advertised as a reunion of the horsemen. Well, you can't do that because Tully Blanchard's not there. So they did the, we don't have Tully Blanchard, but we're going to debut the newest member of the horsemen, Paul Roma. Yeah, so it was Flair, it was Arn, it was Oli, and it was Paul Roma. This was the new reconstituted four horsemen. Several issues. Oli Anderson never really appeared with this iteration of the four horsemen one time, and that was it, at the one (laughs) edition of Flair for the Gold. Yeah, right, yeah. No longer seen so as effectively the three horsemen at that point. (laughs) Pestilence was gone. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Pestilence went to WWE. And like Paul Roma had bounced around. I think he was in WWF prior to this. You know, Mm -hmm. like he'd have, he'd have, he'd had himself a decent career. Yeah. But, and this, this isn't meant to shade towards Paul Roma. He had a good career for himself. Yeah. He wasn't exactly the, the, the level of luminaries as Horseman's past. Yeah, Certainly no Sid. No the Sting. criteria. Yeah. Barry Wyndham <laughs> was a Sid. huge star in NWA. He was a big deal. Very um, and so deal. it didn't last very long, a matter of months, before Roma turned on the horseman to join Paul Orndorff. Also, according to this thing, Paul Roma said that Arn Anderson didn't like him. <laughs> so that didn't help things. Played either. a partner, maybe. So yeah. you had uh, Mr. Wonderful and Paul Roma's former tag team. Yeah. Horseman done until I think ninety five. Was it ninety five or ninety six when they tried to get the get get it back together? Oh, I think it was ninety. I want to say it was ninety six. All right, when they brought like Mongo in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was May 96, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but of course, the other reason you know they were a three piece, but also Arn got stabbed by the other four horsemen member Sid. Yeah, and so he took like a shit ton of time off. Obviously, yeah, because he got stabbed with from scissors. You're right. Exactly. So many times you got to recover from that. And so it just it just fizzled out like there was it just nothing. fell apart. It just completely fell it just apart. it fell apart. Yeah. And then and they came back. They came back kind of strong. I mean, once they had Benoit and Malenko, that was kind of cool. We talked about them in the last one because that was a really cool way to split it with uh, Kurt Hennig, uh, you know, the face of Eric Bischoff's disdain for the four horses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So, yeah, the Paul Roma year is not very good. Well, it wasn't even a year. Months. Months, yeah, the Paul Roma months, yeah. Anyways, let's go ahead and move on to number two. Two. The Hart Foundation, the group, not the tag team. Yes, 1997. Right. So the Hart Foundation, as it existed in 1997, only lasted from March to November. In that time, they basically won every title. Yeah. At some point. So it was Brett, it was Mm -hmm. Anvil, it was Owen, it was Bulldog, and it was Pillman. Right, yeah, and, and they were pretty cool. There was that picture cool. of them yeah. looking like a bunch of badasses wearing some. That, wearing the like feud Zubats. that Brett had with Stone Cold through that summer was really oh, yeah. good. Made made a star. Yeah, it was some really good stuff. Um, and the and Sunny Days promo was yeah, that year. Yep, yeah. and then of course it all came to a head at Survivor Series '97, Montreal Screwjob. Yeah. Brett uh, lost the title. Got the title yanked from his grasp. He tapped out, fool. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he I saw it. I've seen that video plenty of times. Brett totally tapped. Um, <laughs> and so with it, Anvil and Bulldog were so upset with that situation, they left. Well, hold on a second. What? Hold the, Actually, uh, uh, Bulldog did. Anvil oh, that's right. was still there. And in fact... Didn't he get humiliated? A couple, yeah, a couple weeks later, yeah. a week later... DX invited him to their group. He accepted, and they beat the shit out That's of him. Right. And sprayed paid WCW on his back. That's right. I forgot about. Then that. he was released from the company. He went to WCW. That's right. He got utterly humiliated. Yeah, yeah. And then Owen, Owen stayed. Owen stuck around. He joined the uh, the Nation of Domination, mm-hmm. which I remember because that's around when I first started watching mm-hmm. uh, WWF, and I was like, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> <laughs> that was always a curious thing for me. I'm like, I like Owen Hart and everything. But then when I go back and watch Old Nation stuff, you know, because I watched, that's when I first started watching is when Owen's part of the group. And I was like, oh, Nation of Domination. Okay. They got this theme song. It's got a kind of vibe to it. And then I like saw the older stuff. I'm like, they were definitely doing something that this would not work here. 
Uh, but uh, so he joined the nation, mm -hmm. and uh, but by that time, I think the Rock was already done with the nation at that point. So it was like whatever. Um, and then yeah, Bulldog and Nightheart ended up both in WCW. Obviously, Brett was in WCW, and Pillman unfortunately passed away about a month before all that happened. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's a faction breaking up due to what contract negotiations going wrong in the ring. You got that right. All right, man. Let's go ahead and move on. This is sad. Number one. One. The Hurt Business. You know, one of the the, the memories that this, seared in my hold brain. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. Let me let me just let me just start off here. This is probably potentially one of the most interesting breakups because it all happened it behind other people doing stuff in front of the camera. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, I know. Because the last we really saw the hurt business was MVP in the background of certain shots talking to Shelton Benjamin and Cedric Alexander. Yeah. yeah. And he, what he was telling them was, we're breaking up. So one of the images that's, that, that I think I'll remember most clearly from Pandemic Era Raw is that episode where it ended Raw Underground when Hurt Business go in there and yes. destroy everybody. Oh, and we were our fantasy booking brains were like, oh, they're going to take over. Bobby Lashley's going to be Raw Underground champion, and then he's going to come from the underground, and he's going to be dominating people and I everything. I remember exactly that cool. storyline coming to mind. But it was just a, it was, it was a, a, a impressive feat to lay out, I don't know, two dozen people. Dude, no, I'm telling you. When we did like a whole thing where we were like, what could be a raw oh, underground? Well, we, and we, we were booking we, him as the champion. Oh, absolutely. Because we were, we were hoping like, I think it was payback was the pay-per-view that followed um, the debut of raw underground. It's like, oh, they should do like a whole raw underground shoot fight tournament to crown the yeah the first pay, the raw underground champion. Yeah. Flashly with his MMA background make perfect sense. Mm hmm. Yeah. Dude. That happened, no, we were obviously. talking about that. No, but that image know. of them standing there in the middle of the ring with, you know, just the ring. Everybody laid out and them standing tall. Gosh, that was amazing. That was so good. It was good. really cool, man. It was really And that's cool. kind of the thing about Hurt Business is it's not they didn't have success. Like, all the members at one point were champions. Mm -hmm. Shelton and Cedric were tag champ, MVP, and then Lashley were U.S. champ. Lashley was world champ. But even with all that success in such a short amount of time, it felt like there was so much potential for them to do so much more. For sure, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, and you had images like them – destroying everybody in raw underground is standing tall to end raw mm -hmm. and you think of what they were able to do with the bloodline in terms of not just telling stories but creating this incredible moments yeah right you know weaving those moments in the, into the storyline and thinking man you totally could have done that i'm not saying copy and paste beat for beat but you could have told an incredible story with the hurt business yeah if you, yeah, kept you had them like together. cedric being like the hothead yeah. The guy flying. Yeah, you had all the personalities there to do a lot of compelling things with it. And they were over. People really liked the Hurt Business. And the idea of the Hurt Business at full strength, like challenging the bloodline, is a storyline that it's such a crime we never got that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is. Bobby could have lost that match against Roman. It's fine, but you do the thing. Like, you actually do that story. Exactly. It'd be awesome. Exactly. Exactly. And it was, you know, and, and after Cedric and Shelton lost the tag titles, it's when it all kind of start, started. It was a long process of them finally breaking up. Um, uh, Lashley beat him up. He was, he was champ for a spell. Um, it was September of 2021 that Shelton and Cedric helped Lashley fight off the new day. They kind of got back together. They were drafted to raw. Um, and let's see here. And then it was early next year that Lashley just kind of out of nowhere told tell Cedric and Shelton, yeah, the, we're, we're not the Hurt Business anymore. Yeah. And it was just kind yeah. of it. And then they teased it in 2023. They were going to get back together. He had MVP talking to people. And then it just didn't go anywhere. Yeah, those are all just, you know, okay, guys, listen, here's the deal. We're going to do a buyout. You know, you had contracts with the Hurt Business. Uh, we're going to give you 10 cents on the dollar for these contracts. Does that work for you? And then you guys can be free to do whatever you want. I'm like, we don't want to do that. Okay, we'll reconvene same place next week behind another promo. <laughs> we'll talk for about three minutes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was it, was, it, was, it was a serious bummer because there was so much potential, so much potential. And then, and then for them to break up in a fairly underwhelming way 
when they were arguably at their peak. It's not like the Shield where they were at their peak and they broke off and broke up and it was off, everybody went off to do their own things and you know and and there was captivating stuff to follow. Mm-hmm. You know, like MVP was out with an injury for a while. He came back and then he was managing a boss and feuding with yeah. Lashley. And it was like, why? Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, and it's you just... know, dude, it's a sad situation when, as Lashley has recently said, he was a Vince guy. Vince liked Lashley, and Vince, you could tell, liked the Hurt business. Vince didn't know what to do with the Hurt business. That's what it was. He liked them. He didn't know what to do with them. And if you don't have, you know, in the case of the bloodline, Vince didn't do the bloodline. He allowed the bloodline to take up TV Yeah, it was largely Heyman and and Roman, yeah. It's Heyman, Roman, probably Michael Hayes, maybe some other people. And and Vince is like, okay, yeah, let's just go ahead and, you know, this will work. But then who knows how he would have fucked it up if day one went down as planned. Mm Mm-hmm. With and similarly, and so if he if Vince was running the bloodline stuff, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah, it would have been the same thing as, as oh, yeah, her yeah. business. Yeah, it would like, you know, initially, it's supposed to last what two months, yeah. bloodline stuff. So I feel like Vince liked the hurt business, he didn't know what to do with the hurt business. And it might have looked, it might when I say like, it might have been one day he really liked him, the next day he cooled on him, the next day he really liked him. That, that could be too, but he saw value in them enough to put them on TV a bunch. Mm-hmm. Triple H probably could do some killer stuff with them for whatever reason. He's just not into it, and that's a bummer. That's mm-hmm. an absolute bummer. It is. It really bummer. is. It is a bummer. There's yeah. still there still is a lot of potential, a lot of interesting things you could have done with a reunited hurt business, and it's a bummer that it, we never got to see it. Absolutely. Anyways, that's going to do it for this episode of Count Out. Hey, do us a solid. Leave us a comment. The algorithm loves comments. Do that. Hit that thumbs up. Uh, hit the subscribe button and, uh, yeah, till next time we'll see you guys around. Goodbye.